Welcome everyone. My name is Graham Lanetto. I'm the Alpine Director for SWIX USA. And tonight we're going to be doing our fourth clinic in the series with Ski Racing Media. Tonight we're going to cover race day preparations. So we're going to be looking at how to track your equipment specs, measuring your turn radius, equipment inspection, top coat wax application for blocks, liquids, and powders, and then we'll finish off with adjusting ski sharpness for race conditions. Before I go too far, I also want to just mention that we're going to have uh, the fourth series posted on the SWIX YouTube site and then also on the Ski Racing Media site if you want to watch it again later. All right, so getting started. What we're going to focus on first is tracking your equipment spec specifications. So we're going to develop a strategy around your equipment that fits your style by learning what works for you and what doesn't. So we want to understand why your equipment is fast or slow, why you like it or why you don't. So tracking your equipment details will help you understand why you, why you like your equipment or not. And so this is a holistic approach to equipment setup. So once you understand what works for you and what doesn't work for you, it, in the future it'll make it a lot easier to select the equipment that works right for you. And we have a lot of different categories that we'll go over here. Uh, tracking um, the overall characteristics of the ski and helping you understand why it works or doesn't. So if you have equipment you really like, I would say don't ever let it go. Just because there's new equipment coming out doesn't mean it's better than what you have. Uh, what, you, what you might be using now that works for you now um, just because there's a new model that comes out, the, the turn radius could be different, the flex could be different. Uh, equipment's really specific to your skiing style. So if you have equipment that you really like, hold on to it. Um, dig into the details and understand why it works for you. So we're going to start out by uh, just going over pretty basic things. We'll talk about the brand, the discipline, the model number of the skis so you can understand exactly what you have here. So uh, when you get into models, uh, we'll look at specific serial numbers and we want to make sure that things match between disciplines. So you want to make sure your slalom skis have the same model numbers, same size, same with the GS skis. So if you can understand these things, it really helps you out. So a little quick story here. Um, I went down to Chile years ago. I was helping out the team, and I was working with a girl that was telling me that she had two pairs of slalom skis. She really liked one pair. She said it was an older model, and the new model wasn't working for her. They're completely different. So I really kind of dug into what, her, what she had for her skis. I, was, I always tracked the equipment, tried to do what I call a ski audit and understand what's going on. So as I got into her equipment, I realized that her slalom skis were actually exactly the same. Same model, same flex. Really the only difference was her base bevel. And she didn't understand that was the problem. That was the difference between the two pairs. So as we get into this, uh, we'll see how we track those things. And, and then when you understand that that one specific thing is the difference, when you can narrow it down, it really helps you understand your equipment better. All right, so actually, I'm going to jump back here real quick, Pete. So we're going to track that. Uh, we're going to track the brand, the discipline, and then we're going to do the length and the actual serial number here. So you might have to ask your rep if you're using Rosnol or Head or whatever it might be specifically what these numbers correspond to because every brand's going to be a little different. So I can't spend too much time on that because serial numbers will be very different between brands. But this is where you're going to have to develop a relationship with your ski rep. Make sure you have the information on your brand so you understand the model of ski that you have. All right. So binding model and binding height. So these are really important too. So we're going to have to make sure that uh, you're tracking the details on this. So the binding reference, the brand and model, and for consistency, it's important to make sure that the binding models are all consistent between your skis. So you don't have uh, two different head style bindings on your skis, for instance. You want to make sure they're consistently the same across the board so they feel the same. Um, 
Also, really important thing what we want to do is track the binding height for the toe and heel. So uh, we're going to measure from the bottom of the ski to the top of the interfacing portion of the binding here. So as a turnover, we're going to take calipers, and these will measure in millimeters. They're very specific. And any point, the highest point at which the boot's going to interface in the toe and the heel, we want to get a measurement for that and track it. We'll have it in our, in our records. So uh, put it here. I'll get my measurement off the toe, and it's 50. And I'll get my measurement off the heel here, and that's 50 as well. So I'm at 50-50, which means the ski is nice and flat. Um, that's OK for me. This is how I like to ski on my skis. Generally speaking, what you're going to find is that the heel is going to be a little bit higher. It's kind of a neutral stance. So uh, most people probably want to set up their GS skis at perhaps 50 in the heel and 47 or 48 in the toe, so there's a slight downward ramp. When you bring the toe up, the ski gets a little bit more aggressive. Uh, for my recreational skiing, I think it's fun. But uh, for general setups, I'd say try to stick with something that's a little bit no more neutral. But you have to understand the rules. So for uh, most racing, you're going to be 50 for maximum height. Uh, for lower levels, it could be 45. So you just have to do a reference to the rules for your level of racing to make sure you're not going too high. Also, make sure that your skis are consistent, right? So uh, every year I go to Copper Mountain, and I go through this procedure with the, with the NTG team and the D team, and we measure all these skis. And a lot of times the athletes think that their skis are consistent, but when we get into it and we actually measure them, we find that there's a lot of discrepancies and they have to go through and make sure that they're checking the, the lifters or distance plates here to make sure that everything's consistent and the same so we understand why the skis might feel different or, or try to make them ski exactly the same if we can. Okay, again, I mentioned this earlier, but we'll go into a little bit more detail. Is your AFD solid or rotational? So this is a great example. Make sure they're the same, they feel different. So on this one particular binding, this is more like a tank track release mechanism. It's called an AFD. It's an anti-friction device. It's what helps your, helps your boot slide off the toe piece if you need to release off the ski. This is going to be a little softer. It'll give a little bit more that, that tank track rotation, whereas a solid piece of plastic like this one that we have here, this is going to be a lot stiffer and it's going to be a little bit more precise. So they will feel different. So if you have different bindings on different skis, they're not going to feel the same. So make sure they're consistent. OK, plate type, front location is what I check all the time. So there's two things I'm going, I'm going to check here. I want to make sure, if I'm looking at my GS skis or Solemn skis between the pair, I want to make sure that these plates match each other. Uh, this particular style of plate is mounted differently. The ski flex is different than this one over here. Also, um, one is going to be more aggressive than the other. They're going to really feel different on snow. So it's really important that we make sure that this matches on both pairs of skis. And a lot of times I see that one ski is going to have one particular plate and the other is going to be different. It, it, when it's off, you're not going to get a good feel for the skis. You're not going to understand why they feel different. So the other thing I want to do too is make sure that they're mounted in the same position. So whenever I do checks for that, I always check to make sure that it's the same plate consistently between the pair. And I like to check the front of the plate for mount location because I want to make sure they're mounted in the same place. So I just take my tape measure and I just hook it on the tail of the ski here. And I'll measure up into the front of the uh, plate and I'll get a measurement of that point and then I'll reference that in millimeters in my spreadsheet to make sure everything's consistent. If it's not, I'll do a remount and make sure that it is. All right, so then we're going to look at side edge bevel, base bevel, and structure type. We talked a little bit about this over the last couple of clinics, but 
here we're going to try to make sure that everything's consistent. So like that first story I told you about the athlete that thought she had two different model slalom skis. Um, the one that she really liked happened to be a ski that was at half degree on the base edge. So the skis felt really crisp and snappy, really energetic. The other pair of skis, because she didn't check, they had a one and a half degree base bevel. The skis were the same model, same bindings, same plate locations, same flex. It came down to that one difference of half degree versus one and a half degrees, a huge difference. And I explained to her why they felt different. Half degrees quicker, it's more powerful. And the one and a half degrees, really for more of a speed ski setup, really loose, not very edgy. And so she could, that helped her kind of understand like what was going on on her foot. And she knew that she had to make the changes to flatten that ski and match her other ski. And then she had two pairs that she liked. So really easy. It's just a matter of checking this on a regular basis and making sure you understand what's on your foot. So we'll go through and check the side edge bevel, which we'll have our, our file guide. We talked about this in clinic too. So if you want to see it in more detail, you can go to the YouTube, the Swix YouTube station and uh, watch that edge tuning clinic. But we take our file guide and our true bar, we check the side edge guide, make sure it's consistently the same. And then we take our true bar and we would check the base edge bevel. So we're going to check the base edge bevel and make sure that's consistent as well. So when I go to Copper every October to start the season, we do an audit on uh, 200 pairs of skis. And what we find is the bevel can be different on all these different skis, and we're trying to create a, a consistent platform for the athletes to start the season. Out of those 200 pairs of skis, we might grind 160 of them to make sure that they're consistent and ready to start the season and there's no difference there. So we're building a, a solid platform to start the season and there's not, nothing weird with the equipment as you get into the race season. Also, we want to make sure that we have the appropriate grinds or structures on the skis and we want those to match between the pairs as well. Real simple. Uh, just going into base structure here, this is a little bit of uh, information that we covered yesterday. Uh, we want to make sure we have the right structure for a slalom or GS ski, the right structure for a speed ski if we're building a quiver. If I have four pairs of Super G skis, I can get really detailed for different conditions. I can pick a, um, a warm grind, a moderate grind, a cold grind, and I can have a pair of skis for slipping but I can, I can pick the right ski to match those structures to based off of flex, uh, perhaps the, um, the, the base material. If it's a hard base material for cold, I want to match it with a cold grind. If it's a warm structure, I want to match it with a warm base material. Um, but in general, try to keep it simple. A lot of people don't have that many pairs of skis they could, they could go with, but try to match the structures as well as you can per discipline. Uh, this is a little bit more detail with the actual base material, um, a fast base material for slalom skis or uh, a quicker base material, I should say, accelerates quicker or, or if it's going to be a, a, a structure that's going to work better at high speeds for, um, for speed skiing perhaps. But also a lot of these structures or a lot of these base materials have a, like a little inlay in here and that's going to be a harder material that's going to help the ski resist being burnt. So if you look closely at your skis and one ski has that and one ski doesn't, maybe you want to pick this one that has the inlay as your race ski if you like it because it's going to be a little bit more durable and hold up better over time. All right, so we'll get into measuring the turn radius here. And it's a step-by-step -step procedure that we'll follow. And we're going to be using the switch, the, the, um, this Alpine turn radius calculator, if I can say it right. So we're going to track the details as we go here. And this is really going to help us understand why we like the skis. Um, if the skis are a little bit off between the two pairs, which I see often, you might understand that one ski is going to have less turn radius than the other. Or why am I faster on this one pair of skis than the other? A lot of times it could be the turn radius. And so 
a lot of times the skis will actually have the turn radius written right on there, but that doesn't mean that's what it is. It's just a graphic. Um, they have to put this on here for the FIS. It has to say this is a World Cup um, GS ski. It has to be a radius greater than 30 meter. That doesn't mean it's 30 meter. It just means it's greater than 30 meter. So it's good to go through, measure it, and understand what the difference is because a difference of two meters between uh, GS skis could be a few tenths of a second, maybe even, maybe even a half a second, depending on how you ski. So uh, we want to make sure we match it to our skiing style. All right, so this app, you can find it at the Apple Store. Uh, you can download it right onto your phone. And it's, it's not the easiest thing to work with, but I'm going to go through step by step to show you how to use it. And uh, once it, you, you get into the habit of using this, it's actually pretty easy. Okay, so first we're going to measure the length. And, and a lot of the pictures that I show up here, I'm using something called the turn radius spider that you put over the top of the ski and it helps you uh, find sp specific spots on the uh, ski to measure. But you can do it pretty easy with a, a set of calipers and a tape measure. So the first thing that you're going to do is take your tape measure and we're going to clamp it right onto the ski base up. Just clamp it in the back. Take it right up over the front, lock the tape in place, and hold it right there. I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna get the overall running length of this ski. So I check it, get the full measurement in millimeters, and I'm gonna put it right into the app. That's the first measurement. You gotta make sure that you reset it before you start. So uh, 193 we'll go with here. So that's our first measurement. Second measurement here is we want to find the narrowest portion underfoot. So a lot of times that's going to correspond to a little mark that they'll have on the ski that shows like where the center of boot should be. And it's not a perfect area. There's usually a couple of inches here that it, it could be. So once you locate that spot, you want to get that measurement as well. So once I locate that spot, I get the measurement from the tail. And then I put that in millimeters into the app here. And then once you have those two calculations, it's going to give you all the numbers for measurement locations on the ski. So once again, we're going to get this measurement first, get this measurement next. Once you put that one in, all these pop up. So this is going to be a measurement for the tail measurement for the waist, and a measurement for the tip. And those, those areas, we're going to get measurements with, the, with these mics for the width of the ski. And that's going to tell you what your turn radius is. So we're going to start off first with the tail measurement. So it's, it's basically 8 centimeters from the tail. So I go all the way to the back of the ski here. I'm measuring 8.3 centimeters, and I get my measurement and I put that right into the app here, so it's 82. And then I need to get my second measurement at 888. It's going to be in the waist here. Put that on the ski. I'm going to get another measurement of 68. I put that right into the app. And then finally, I'm going to get this tip measurement. I'm going to go all the way up into the tip at 1,710, put that right on there, and I get my measurement of 98, and I enter that into the app. I hit calculate radius, all right, at this point it's going to kick out the true turn radius of the ski. There's a little bit of variance with one that they call calculate um, tolerance. The tolerance is going to give you um, a little bit bigger number. So you could actually have a ski that measures 29.98, the true turn radius. But the FIS will, will go off this, this with tolerance to give you a little bit of room for error. So this is the number they want to see. So for this GS ski, we know it's legal at 30.53. So there's, it's good there. Um, you might measure your other ski and find that it's at 32. 
it happens. I see it a lot with the measurements that we do. So I can say to an athlete at this point, hey, we went through your skis. You have the same model. You have the same bindings. You have the same plates. Everything's consistent. Your base bevel's the same. But we're timing you, and in, in timing, you're faster on the ski that's a 32 meter, and you're slower on the ski that's a 30 meter. So now we're starting to develop a picture of what's working for you. And really, that's going to come down to skiing style. Um, maybe you're really good at turning and you can get away with skiing on a straighter ski that's going to make you faster. Maybe you're not as strong at turning and maybe that ski that's really close to the turn radius is going to help you. But you don't really know unless you start to develop this picture and understanding your equipment. So this is a, a big part of what I do and it's a big part of how I help the athletes start out their season and helping them understand all this. Okay, other things to consider. So ski flex and hard or soft snow conditions. So um, if I'm selecting skis and I'm trying to figure out what type of structure I want to put on them for racing, let's say I had four Super G skis, I'd go through the skis and I would want to look at the base material, understand if it's a cold base material or a warm base material. And then I'd get, once I knew that, I would go through the skis and start to flex them and understand how stiff they are. If I had a cold base that had a pretty stiff um, flex, I would want that ski for harder conditions. Because if I'm skiing on a really stiff ski in softer snow, that ski might plow or, or tend to go straighter because it won't flex as easy. So I could pick a cold grind for cold conditions with my stiff ski and match it to perform the best. And also if I have a softer flexing ski, maybe that's gonna work better in, um, in warmer, softer conditions. So it's, it's just uh, a way to match your equipment for the overall conditions that you're gonna be racing in. Um, this one's really interesting. Uh, it's a pretty high level measurement and it's something to consider for sure. And it's, um, it's turn radius and deflection. So when a ski comes out of the mold, you know, we can go over to the grease board here. And we just talked about turn radius and the measurement. So if the ski comes out of the mold and it's shaped like this, and we went through and we did our measurement to understand the length and the width, and we came up with 30, 30 meters, let's say. It's legal. What happens a lot of times when skis come out of the mold is they're not symmetrical. They're asymmetrical. So as they dry, one side of the ski might have more shape. I'm going to draw this pretty extreme. And the other side might not have as much. So I've seen skis when I do my measurements that actually could be uh, four meters um, turnier on one side and four meters less turny on the other side. So the fist doesn't measure this. They don't measure this asymmetrical deflection. They only measure this. So if I actually have a ski that matches all the same measurements over here, matches all the same measurements over here, it's still 30 meter, but it's asymmetrical. I might find that this side of the ski is 26 meter and this, this side is much straighter. So if I have a pair of skis that are uh, bent in the same uh, opposite direction, I can match them together and I could, I could make one a right and a left ski. Um, if I don't, then I'm kind of in trouble. You might understand why you don't like a pair of skis because they're, they're not matching in the, in the right manner. But if I have pairs that are real similar skis and I can go through and uh, take one ski out of one pair and one ski out of another pair and match them so that they're, the turn radiuses are, are good as a pair, then I'm in business. And, and of course, I'm gonna have to go through testing with the athlete and make sure that this works for them in particular. So it's just another way of uh, understanding your equipment. And it's a real thing, this happens quite a bit. So you gotta keep an eye on it. Um, once I find if I like a ski a certain way, or even if they're straight, oftentimes I'll just put a little arrow and that, that'll be my right ski. And I'll put an arrow on the other one. That's my left ski and I, I just know which edges are which throughout the season.
All right. So as a racer, you need to focus on things that you can control. And I want to go through a basic equipment inspection, things that you're going to go through, not the day before the race, but probably like three or four days out to give you some time to adjust or adapt or fix something if you need to. It's always a ski emergency when you discover that something's broken and uh, you want to make sure you have enough time to adapt and make the changes that you need to. But we'll start out with boots. So when you start the season, you have your boots and uh, you know, you'll get your cant work done and your lifter set up. And what I would recommend doing is once you get it set, just make marks so you understand exactly where your cuffs are set because things can come loose throughout the season and move. And oftentimes, like when you start the season, the coaches think everything looked pretty good with your cants, and then maybe a month into the season, they don't like them how they look anymore. So there's a couple things that could have changed. Could have been your base bevel, like we talked about, or it could just be your boots. So if I make a mark like this, whenever I go back to check my boots for this inspection, I can just take a look and see that this, this hasn't moved at all. Right, so I'll just make a mark on each side, and that makes that pretty simple. I keep an eye on that throughout the year. Um, look your boots over for cracks. Uh, this, this is really important, too. I worked with an athlete years ago. Um, everything was good with the equipment. I didn't manage the boots on a regular basis, um, something I kind of was leaning on her to do. And what we found was two days before world championships, the boots were cracked. And we had new boots, but they were a little different because they're just, they weren't used as much. So make sure you look over your boots, look over the inside, look for any cracks, look for cracks in between the cuffs here. Look, look for cracks um, in the instep right here. Just this the areas that have a lot of pressure on them on a regular basis, make sure you keep an eye on them. Um, check all the buckles, make sure they're secure on a regular basis. I'd say every week, just go through, check every buckle, make sure it's nice and tight. Just run all the way around the boot. And then any of the other flex points, just make sure you have some tools with you and you can just make sure everything's tight and working properly and not broken. The other thing you're going to want to do with your boots is take your true bar and just check the bottoms. You know, like if I just take a look at them and, and make sure they're flat. Um, if you're walking a lot in your boots and you're not using cat tracks, it'll really wear down the lifters. So it's a good idea just to put a true bar on there and make sure that they're clean and true and not getting worn out. And that happens a lot. All right, um, we'll switch over to bindings. And this is really important that we check the bindings on a regular basis, especially before races to make sure that they're functioning properly. So look over all the spring settings. Uh, when you start your season and you get your bindings mounted, spend some time with the technician at the store Ask them to show you how, that the, how, how the springs are set, where they're set, why they're set that way. And then ask them how to show you how your boot actually fits into the system and how to check it for proper uh, adjustment. So that's going to help you throughout the season. If you can just put the boot in the system, check the adjustment, then you know something hasn't changed, the binding hasn't accidentally moved. Um, believe it or not, that you have the right ski. Sometimes the athletes mix up skis at the hill. I've seen that, that happen before. So it's a good habit to get into. Check the spring rates, check the adjustment, and just make sure everything looks good with the binding, with the boot and the system. And then we're gonna wanna make sure, sure that we check all the fixation points on the binding itself. So we're gonna take our screwdriver, and I'll just look at the ski from the side and I want to make sure it's nice and, and the binding's nice and flush and flat against the plate. Sometimes when the, when the bindings are mounted, if they're not screwed down tight enough, the, bind, the screw itself will, will feel snug, but it, it's not down all the way. So it's a good idea to always check and make sure that your bindings are, are secured against the plate of the ski. And then really carefully, just go from screw to screw and make sure that they're snug and tight and nothing's come loose. It's a good idea to check all the screws in the system on a regular basis. 
All right, um, so the skis themselves, we're gonna do a visual inspection to make sure that they're looking good too. So the best thing to do is to take the pair of skis and we're gonna check the overall camber of the ski and make sure it's not bent at all. So how you do that is hold the skis together and squeeze them together like that. And I'll check the first, well, the shovel of the ski and make sure there's not any bends or anything. What I'm looking for is when I put these skis together, I don't have one ski that's like this. So obviously, if the ski's out like that, the ski's bent, and you can bend them back. If you take them to a shop that's comfortable bending skis back, uh, you can get that um, to go back. Sometimes you might run the risk of breaking the ski. If you're still able to use them because it's a slight bend, I would say use them as is because you might break the ski. If it's extreme, I would say go ahead and take it to the shop and see if they can straighten it out because you're not going to use the ski if it's bent that badly. Um, also do the same in the tail. Make sure the ski's nice and straight with no bends. Also, we want to check the sidewalls and look for any cracks or delaminations. So you can just put the skis in the vices and just look over the sidewall materials. Look for any small cracks or deviations. And sometimes you can't see it because the skis might be dry. So if you're in the ski room and it's a dry environment, those cracks might be hard to actually see. So the best time to check the skis is after you've been skiing. If the skis are in the ski room and they're drying out, come back down, wipe them down. And then the core or the wood might be wet and it will expand. So it'll really expose any areas that are cracked or broken with the sidewalls. Also, with slalom skis, just from skiing gates, uh, if the athlete's coming across the hill and the gate's coming down and hitting the tip, we're going to have to make sure we do a really good visual inspection of the tip to make sure that the sidewall material is not broken. You see it all the time with slalom skis. You might see a little bit of gate jammed in, to, in between the tightenal sheet and the sidewall, or you might just see like a little deflection or crack. So check it on a regular basis. Make sure the skis aren't broken or bent. Uh, general equipment inspection. Make sure you look over your equipment. You're going to be looking at your poles. I want to look over my poles and make sure that the straps aren't frayed or coming apart. I want to make sure the grips are nice and solid. Um, I'll do a visual inspection to make sure there isn't any chips or cracks or bends that where the pole might actually break. And look over your baskets too. Make sure that they're solid and in place. It's a good idea to have backups. Have extra baskets in your bag so you can swap them out if you need to. Um, also look over your straps on your protection. Make sure that they're not worn out or ready to break. Check the fixation points. It's easy to fix when you're at, the, at your house a couple of days before the race. It's pretty tough to do it before, right before the race. Uh, also check your helmet for any cracks, dings, any sort of thing like that. Just replace your helmet. If there's any sort of damage, it's best just to replace it. All right, so final preparations. This is where we're going to talk about putting on the race coat, the liquid, the powder, or the block. All right, so a lot of these, some of these we're going to have to do in the ski room. Some of these we can actually do on the hill before the race. And uh, we'll kick it off here with the liquid application. So this is going to be probably the easiest uh, top coat or race coat, race day application that you can do. And uh, again, we have, we have a couple different waxes we can work with. We have the Swix HS and we have the Swix TS, so high speed and top speed, depending on the, the uh, speed that's going to fit your budget. Um, the, what, how we want to start out is, you know, our skis have been prepped for the race. We've done all the scraping and brushing and we're getting ready for that last coat. So the ski should be pretty clean at this point. I'm just going to run a scraper down the ski before I apply that liquid wax. And then we'll do a brush with the nylon here. And then we're going to be ready to apply that liquid. Once again, in the ski room, 
We always want to be safe with the right PPE. Uh, in order for me to talk to you, I'm just going to wear this uh, simple mask here. All right, and uh, so you just pick the wax of the day. Let's say, let's say you uh, race for your wax for the first run. It's going to be really cold. And second run, it warmed up quite a bit. So let's say we waxed uh, five hardness. Second run's really more of eight conditions, warm. So I can simply boost my wax with the eight, eight liquid here. So it's really easy to apply to shake it up. And uh, TS is a liquid as well. This is going to be a full spray. So this is going to come out pretty quick when we spray the ski. The liquid's going to be more of a felt tip application, but it's the same method. We're going to put the liquid on the ski, let it dry for 15 minutes, and then we're just going to brush it out. So this is really easy to do. It comes out fast. I like to keep it relatively close to the ski. And I'm going to start up in the tip, and I'm going to make a quick pass down the ski and let it dry for 15 minutes. So that's the liquid wax application. It couldn't be any easier. And the stuff really does work great. So I would have let this dry. Depending on where you are, if you're outside and it's a little windy, it's going to dry pretty quick. If you're inside, uh, it could take 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I can see here that it's starting to dry out already. But we won't sit here and wait for it. I'll just grab this other ski. So you could ski on it just like that if you wanted to. You can also take, uh, if you want to spread it around the ski so it's more uniform, you could also use a simple felt cork like this. And you could just move it around the ski to make sure it's good penetration, good coverage. But when we're done, we're going to use a nylon brush just to brush it out. And once again, we'll start in the tip and we're just going to move right down the ski here. And that's it. We can just make a final pass with a little bit of fiberline. and you're race ready. So once again, these waxes are the easiest, fastest application that you can put on before the race for these conditions. So it's a great option. And also, they're pretty cost effective because you're going to get about 15 to 20 applications out of that. All right. So now we're going to switch over to powder applications. And tonight, I'm just going to work with our marathon waxes. So this is a great example because, as I talked about yesterday, the marathon waxes that are in the paraffin form are really hard and they're a little bit more difficult to work with. But what we've done with the powder version is pulverized it and made it a softer, uh, easier uh, application. So we want to make sure that the skis are clean and brushed out. I'm just going to do that real quick again when I'm scraper and my brush and I'm gonna pick the powder of the day I think uh, tomorrow is gonna be new snow so I'm gonna use the marathon white and what we're gonna do is apply a liberal amount of this wax to cover the base All right, so we're going to use Marathon Black because there's more in there. <laughs> Sorry, I just ran out of that wax right there. So put it on the ski. Don't be afraid to use it. And then we just want to make sure that we reference the temperature on the packaging. So we're going to be at 150. I can see my iron's already set at 150. And then we're just going to make a quick pass here. So one quick pass down. It's going to be about eight seconds for the full length pass, and I'll do one more after that. And keep in mind, this is a pretty hard wax, so it's going to be 
generally speaking, if I was using the paraffin, it would be pretty tough to iron it in. But since this is powder, it's quite easy. And I can see that that wax is getting down into the structure. The structure is standing tall. And we had good penetration. So I made two quick passes. I didn't get the skis overly hot. I don't feel any heat coming through the core of the ski that we talked about yesterday. And then we're going to make sh sure this ski cools the room temperature before we scrape it. So you can see that this is a pretty hard wax. But it w once again, it was like pretty easy to apply. So once this cools down to room temperature, I'm just going to scrape it off using a sharp plastic scraper. Start at the tip. And I want to scrape off as much wax as I can. We want wax in the ski, not on top of the ski. You probably see a lot of particulates. With the, with the uh, colder waxes, there's a lot more of that in there, so make sure that you have your PPE. Make one more full length pass, and then it's time to brush the ski out. So I'm going to start with the large oval steel. I'm going to brush out as much as I can and move through our brush progression. Take my scraper and get some of this debris off the ski. Okay, and I'll go to some Fiberlene. And then at this point, I could move to my brass brush and into Finishing it with a nylon brush after that. So if I'm waxing a cold, cold wax, if I'm using five, six, any of the marathon waxes, um, for the cold wax application for race overlay, we're talking about using the marathon paraffin. And that's what we're using in conjunction with the Roto Wool. So this is the new product that came out this year. And so this is going to be for colder race day application. If it's going to be um, six category in wet conditions, I'm going to lean on the HS liquids, TS liquids. If it's six category in dry colder conditions or five or four polar i'm going to lean on this application i'm going to show you here right now so cold weather overlay application of marathon paraffin so what we're going to do is set up the roto brush with the cordless drill here And I'm going to spin this at 1500 RPMs to apply the marathon. So I'll just take the marathon block, spin this brush, 1500, and for about five or six seconds, I'm just going to burn that wax right into this brush. All right, so that's applied to the brush. And what we're going to do here is make three full length passes. We're going to apply that wax with the application 
of the roto wool and then when we're done we're going to use a clean roto wool to clean that out because we don't want to use, uh, use a, a dirty loaded up roto wool to do the final passes we're going to want to clean so we're going to need two different brushes for that so i'll start in the tip make sure that this barrel is spinning down the ski to the tail we want to make sure that we see debris coming off the brush heading towards the tail so with moderate pressure 1500 rpms i'm just going to make my way down the ski back up to the tip and one full length pass to the tail And that's the application for the Marathon Roto-Wool. And then I'm going to take this brush off. Once again, this is just for application. I'm going to use this one all the time for the application. And I'm going to use this one for the cleaning after. Set it up the same way. And then we're going to make three full length passes with the clean brush. And this brush is doing all the work. It's doing all the cleaning. And again, the idea with this is that there's hard paraffin that's down in the ski. And what we want to do is use this, the friction from the soft fleece of the roto wool to get down into those low areas, melt that low laying paraffin, kind of melt it and, and cover the structure uh, properly. So we're not going to have paraffin down in there that gets caught up and hung up in really aggressive snow crystals. So three more passes with this. Moderate pressure. It does a very nice job of polishing. And that's it. We don't need to do any brushing beyond that because this is the finest brush that we have in our quiver. I'm just going to take a little bit of Fiberline and wipe off the base material and the sidewalls of the ski. And now we're ready for cold race day. All right. And then finally, I know I talked a lot about this in the series number two with edge tuning, but it's, it's an important race day consideration. And that's going to be setting up your ski sharpness for the conditions. So as I said, in the ski room, you're going to want to make sure that you get your ski as sharp as you can. It's harder to make your ski. It's a lot easier to make your ski duller when you get out on the hill if you have dry grippy conditions. So th that's the method. And so if we get out on the hill and we discover that it's really icy conditions and you have a nice sharp ski, I would say just leave it there. That's going to be the best setup for you for really icy conditions. If it's a dry grippy snow, it's better to have a ski that's a little bit looser that you can stiv it and slide. And that's going to require taking a little bit of the hum or the sharpness off the ski. So how do you do that? We talked about this on Tuesday. So what we're going to have in our pocket is a uh, gummy stone and you can just adjust the sharpness of the side edge and just dial it in. So you have that gummy stone in your pocket, go out and find a pitch that's similar to the race hill and ski on your skis and try to get them to stiv it and slide and articulate that ski. If you can't get off the edge because it's too sharp, take your gummy stone make a three full length passes take a little bit of the hum off ski on it again see if you can get it to break loose keep chipping away at that until you find the spot where your skis you can articulate your skis they're not overly aggressive and then if you feel like you've taken a little bit of the race wax off your ski because you took one or two runs to make sure that your edge sharpness was dialed in that's where you can kind of go back to supporting your skis with the liquid waxes at the start again so it's pretty easy. Um, you can't ever get that first run back. Make sure the edge sharpness is right. Don't be afraid to take a run on your skis. All right, so that's gonna do it tonight. Tonight's clinic was a little bit quicker. We're gonna leave it open for some questions here at the end. And uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat. Again, if you missed anything, we're gonna have these clinics posted on 
the YouTube channel or, and the SRM Media website. If you can only set one structure, is it better to set colder, warmer, or just a happy middle point? If you can only set one structure, basically what would you do, uh, given the conditions? It's kind of an educated guess, like every region is going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, I live in Vermont. I had my store in Vermont for 16 years. Uh, for our region, we had something that was a little colder for really cold, dry snow. Um, that seemed to work the best. I, I could get detailed with other structures if I needed to. If I lived in the Pacific Northwest, maybe I want something that has a little bit more structure to it to help move water underfoot. I would say, generally speaking, pick something middle of the road, and a good rule of thumb is you want to see the structure but not feel it. If you, can f if you run your fingernails across the ski and it feels really aggressive, that can ski really aggressively and it can be hard to get off the edge. Also, with structure, you can see it with the ski here. It's blank on each side. So that's actually a really helpful feature but why? So if a structure is inside of the edges, so if you have a ski shape like this, and then you'll see a lot of the structures just run down and they don't actually touch the edge material. The reason for that is a couple of things. So when I look at this structure from, uh, I guess, from the base, if I'm, if I'm looking at it, it's like this. There's high points and low points. And we talked about this with that, with that, um, with that marathon wax. You know, the low points are where that, that wax gets stuck, where we have to get in there and clean that out. So maybe that helps you understand, like, which direction I'm working here. If, uh, if I run that structure the way it is with the high peaks and low peaks that you see on the ski, if I go all the way edge to edge with it, when I get right to the edge, we have the metal edge here. And if that structure is right at the edge there, underfoot, you're going to have a lot of abrasion and heat that builds up just from skiing. Like if you slide or stib it, when you, when you slide on the snow, it's very aggressive and it creates heat with the edge. And then of course you have right next to that metal hot edge is, is base material. So with those high points of the fins on the structure, if it goes all the way to the edge, they'll get worn down and abraded and beat up and hairy. So this, the structure itself will wear down quicker. And then you, you might find that you end up having like really low spots right next to the edge, especially underfoot. It's called base burn. So you'll have a lot of base burn in this area from that grind that goes edge to edge. So the idea with the structure that's inside or away from those areas is that we're going to reduce those high points, those uh, delicate structures, and we're just going to have a structure that goes flat away from that edge, and then, and then we get into this more of the, the structure with the high points and low points. This is much more durable than those, than those points there. And then finally, if you run the structure right into the edge, when you, when you look closely at the edge itself, it gets etched from the stone. So those etches can ski really aggressively, and that can be a hard thing to get off the edge when you're actually skiing. So you're going to see uh, these structures on most of the skis these days, and uh, it doesn't really affect the glide too much. Um, but to keep it simple, I would say probably pick a structure that's a little less aggressive if you're not sure. What are the cons of flattening the skis, and how many times can we do it? What are the cons of flattening the skis, and how many times can you do it? So that's a great question. And what we're talking about is how many times can you, can you stone grind your skis? What are the bad points about doing that? I would say that um, it's really important to make sure that your base bevel is correct. So if the base bevel is off and your skis aren't skiing right, it's always good to have them stone ground and uh, have that bevel set correctly. 
Some people say to me, well, I'm really nervous to get my skis stone ground because I put so much wax work into them and I don't want to take a step backwards with the glide. If you take your skis to a reputable shop that is really profession, at, proficient at stone grinding, your skis will be fast right off the machine. I'm confident of it. It won't be an issue. Um, I would rather have your skis stone ground and have that bevel set correctly than have skis that were maybe a little faster in a straight line, but you can't turn. Finally, uh, you know, I've ground, I've ground thousands of pairs of skis. And years and years ago, I would have said comfortably that you could probably grind your skis eight times, six to eight times. But I think over the years, this base material has gotten thinner. Um, it's not something that you can see, but I think probably when they're making tens of thousands of skis, if the base material is thinner, they probably make more money. Uh, what I had found in my personal experience is you're probably only going to be able to grind new skis four or six times. I would get nervous grinding skis at four times. And um, there's nothing you can do about it. You got to make sure that your skis are set up correctly. And I would just think that I, I need to grind my skis. And if I grind through them, I'll, I'm going to end up buying some new skis. Please go over true bar and ski boot. Uh, go over true bar and ski boot. I was just talking about checking the uh, bottoms of the boots to make sure that they're true. And usually I, I would be saying that just because if you have lifters on your boots and you're walking across cement on a regular basis without wearing cat tracks, uh, this can become un untrue and not flat anymore. I haven't lifted these boots yet, so they don't have the lifter on here. But this isn't my true bar either, but it's pretty, pretty straight. But when I put this on here, I can see that this material is really nice and flat and straight. I want the same to be true when I have my lifters on here. But if I'm walking around, I would have so many boots come through my shop for mounts from racers that didn't put the cat tracks on, and the lifters would be all worn out and broken and, and, and not true anymore. I put my true bar on there and rock it back and forth. So just imagine if you're standing in your bindings with worn out lifters that you can move like this. I guess the performance wouldn't be that great. So I would check that on a regular basis and replace the lifters if you need to. Does it matter the temperature of the ski when applying the spray or liquid wax? Does it matter the temperature of the ski applying the spray or liquid wax? I would say probably not. I, I, I like to do it inside in, in a warm environment, but like these waxes you can use out on the hill. And if it's cold out, you can definitely put them on. I've put this on in cold weather before and it works great. It might take a little while longer to dry in like really cold conditions, but if you just make sure you give yourself the, what we say, 10 or 15 minutes, it shouldn't be any problem at all. What are the things to consider when choosing lifter height on the bottom of the boots and under the binding? What are the things to con consider when selecting lifter heights under the uh, the bottom of the boots and under the binding? Under the bottom of the boots and under the binding. Okay, thanks, Pete. Yeah. Um, a couple of things. Uh, as you go higher, whether it's your boot or your binding, you're going to have more leverage, and the skis are going to be more powerful. But as you go up, the skis become slower too to edge. So. There's a trade-off. Um, years ago, it used to be that you could be up at 55 millimeters for height, and that was really pretty high. Uh, they reduced it to 50 because they thought the skis were too powerful and they wanted to take some aggression away to save on injuries. So for me, at 50 millimeters uh, with the binding height, I think it's pretty fair. I don't think it's like a too high or the skis are going to be a really slow to edge. So I would say with your, with your lifters for your skis, with your bindings, I would lift it as high as I can to the rule as I, as I possibly can. Um, keep in mind, when you, if you're doing an aggressive lifter setup, if you lift the toe like gas pedaling, it's super aggressive. I mean, some people like that, some people don't. I, I have worked with a lot of coaches that just recommend they want something neutral that's not overly aggressive. So once again, that's gonna be like 50 in the heel and like 46, 47 in the toe. You want a little bit of downward ramp there. You can get into doing some more aggressive setups when you're a World Cup racer and you have a tech, tech team that can help you. So that's what I'd say about that. 
with with the boots i would say you know pick a moderate size lifter don't go too crazy with it like for me recreationally um, i might put a, a bigger lifter on here because i just like how it feels it's fun you have to make sure it's legal too so if you if you have a lifter that goes on here it's a good idea to take it to somebody that can check the lift height with your with your um with your footbed in the boot to make sure it's legal um, it's all personal preference paraffin versus powder why would you choose one over the other paraffin versus powder why would you choose one over the other so with the marathon waxes these are going to be really hard in the in the block paraffin form so this wax this is this is the same wax here but this is going to be an iron inversion that you use traditionally this wax is harder and more difficult to work with with the iron this is the same wax but in a powder form it's going to be a lot easier to work with this paraffin block i can use with the with the um, roto wool for that race day cold application that we talked about that's the difference but i think for me in general this 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 product the powder is so easy to work with this is like my this is my choice for sure What's the durability of the Marathon Paraffin in extreme cold? What's the durability of the Marathon Paraffin in extreme cold? Probably some of our most durable wax that we have. It's, it's great. I mean, this, this wax has really been uh, a, a huge part of the new system and has been very durable, and we're seeing results on the World Cup with the test team. This stuff's fast. Do you ever use sidewall wax? Do I ever use sidewall wax? Um, yeah, I used to do that quite a bit. It's a lot of work, and uh, I'd pretty much only do it for speed skis. But at, at one point, I used to go through and sand all the sidewalls, and I would actually tape off the bindings, and I would drip wax onto the sidewalls and iron it in. And then I would chip it off, and then I would take a, a scrubber from um, doing the dishes and just buff it out. And it, the sidewalls become really smooth and fast. It's a lot of work, and uh, and and it's pretty cool. I think it, you know if you're on edge a lot, especially like super G or downhill, it probably is a little faster. F4 paste wax for sidewalls. Is, oh, it's pretty good. Uh, how do you decide between HS and TS liquids? How do you decide between HS or TS liquids? Um, they're both great. HS liquids are great. TS liquids are great. The question is, what fits your budget? TS, as we talked about yesterday, is when every tenth of a second counts. It's going to be more expensive. The HS is a really good product. Uh, the price is a lot, um, it's a lot, well, it's the intermediately priced, I guess you could say. So uh, what fits your budget is the bottom line. Will that side cut radius calculator work accurately for snowboards as well, or is it pretty much ski specific? Will the side cut radius calculator work for snowboards as well? I think it will. I think so. I've never tried it before, but I think it will work. How is the durability of the wax applied using the roto wool, and which makes which waxes can you use the roto wool? Okay. How's the durability with the roto wool? and which waxes can you use with the roto wool this is a, as i've said this is a really cool uh addition to our our uh, tuning line this year and uh we're really seeing that you can use this with cold waxes so if i'm using a six a five or a puller or any of the marathons i'm using this brush on my final pass you know i really want to make sure that those low areas in the structure that we talked about are clean so even if i'm not applying the marathon as a, as a race layover, I, I'm using this brush as my final pass, the final buffing. Um, in terms of durability, yeah, the durability has been really good. I mean, I, I don't think it, you can uh, speak any higher of it except from the results that we hear from our Nordic test team. You know, we're, we have racers that are going out for 25, 50K races, and this stuff's holding up great. So it's very durable. Your three-brush quiver recommendation. My three brush quiver recommendation is the large oval steel, the medium brass brush or bronze, and uh, a nylon brush. 
If you're going to build a kit, I would say start with the nylon, then get yourself a, a medium bronze brush or brass brush, and then I would add this oval steel at the end. What if we take it to the extreme and use TS wax, then TS powder, iron or cork, and then TS liquid? Is there an advantage or is it just a waste of money? Um, what's the advantage of using the whole TS line? Uh, is there an advantage? I, I think if you're using it properly for the conditions that we have, I think it's, I think it's a good option. You're going to have fast skis. Um, but make sure that you're using the wax of the day. You know, you don't want to use, uh, for instance, the six. The, the liquids that we have only go down to the six category. And that's why I said we have that transition between six and the marathon rotowool application. So the way I look at it is if it's six and it's really wet conditions, I'm going to use the liquid. If it's six and it's trending drier, I'm going to use the rotowool application with the marathon. But, but yes, if you use TS in, in all the right categories and everything matches up right, it's, you're going to have fast skis. How do the Fitz World Cup skiers select their skis for the race, and how often do they change the edges on them? How do the Fitz World Cup skiers select skis for races, and how often do they change the edges on them? So it depends. Uh, it de really depends on who the racer is. It's all, this, all this is very specific. So you could be a racer and you have one pair of skis that are really good. If there are one pair of downhill skis that they use all the time. Uh, could be, um, well I, I had a racer that we had one pair of super, or GS skis that were like head and shoulders better than anything else that we had. And, and uh, there was something really unique about the skis. They had a ton of camber. When I first got the skis, I put them together and they were that far apart underneath the binding. I thought the skis were going to be garbage. They were so fast. And I couldn't find another pair of skis like them. So at a certain point, the edges were getting thin on those skis. And I really only let her use those skis the day before a World Cup just to kind of get used to the skis and then for racing. Uh, you might find that's the situation. You might find somebody that has a bunch of skis that work well, and you can be really specific with the structures for the snow conditions. It, it just really depends. Concerning edge sharpness, should you wax first, then tape the base, do the edges, and then brush with the blue nylon? Uh, trying to maintain edge sharpness, is it better to pr protect the edges from... I'll oh, say it again, I'm uh, sorry. Waxing Waxing first. Wax first. Then tape the base. Then tape the base. Then do the edges. Then do the edges. Then brush. And then brush. I, I like to keep things pretty simple. So like I, I go through the progression that I talked about and if I get done, you know, maybe if I got done doing the uh, the the roto wool, you know, the roto wool is gonna hang over the edges a little bit. When I get done, I might actually go back in and just uh, feel the edges and if I feel like I need to bring the sharpness back I, I just quickly hit them with a little bit of a, a diamond stone progression to make sure that edge sharpness was where I needed it um, but that's what I do and so everybody's going to be a little different on how they want to approach that but um, I'm not afraid to go back with my tools and touch it up and if I need to brush the ski one more time when I'm done that's that's the way I would do it. Do you ever do anything special to harden the base near the edge to prevent burn in abrasive conditions? Do I ever do anything special to prevent burn on cold conditions next to the edge that we talked about? And you can, for sure. So you can use, I don't have it with me right now, but we have that polar, we talked about yesterday, polar powder. And so that's actually used as a supplement to make uh, the wax more durable. So you could apply HS5, which is going to be our hardest wax in that cat in the HS line. And when you're done, you could make a pass with the iron, the, the, the ski's still a little bit wet. You could basically take that polar powder and just put it over the top and make one more flash pass. And what that's going to do is harden that wax a little bit more. It's going to give you more durability for those really aggressive conditions. But next to the edge, that would help with the base burn a little bit. 
The problem with base burn is it's from that sliding and it creates heat. And unfortunately, there's not a lot you can do except for knife a nice clean turn and you don't slide at all or skid. Um, and you can hope that you have a ski that has that harder in inlay or, or harder base, ma base material next to the edge. That those, those are the best things you can do. Clean turns and a quality ski. Which waxes can you add to the Marathon wax? Any temperature wax? Which waxes can you add to the Marathon wax? Any temperature wax? You can, the Marathon is a, is a, a hard, like we said, it's basically like a hard universal wax for racing. So you have uh, universal new snow, universal old snow. You don't have to add anything to it. You can use it just as is. But for really extreme conditions, I would think about using that polar powder that I just mentioned to boost the hardness of the wax and give it more durability. Do you ever tape the base while tuning the edges? Do I ever tape the base while tuning the edges? Uh, I, I have. Um, the, I, I remember years and years ago I was using my tools and I really scratched up my base material and I was like petrified that I was going to scratch my, my, my base. So I was putting a lot of PVC tape on the ski. Uh, I think that it's not great because you're, you're putting adhesive on the base. So you, you, you have a base material that you want to, to glide smooth and free and, and the idea of putting an adhesive strip of tape to it doesn't really fit that great. Uh, what I found was I'm better off just taking my tools, uh, taking a, a ceramic stone and just running around my tools and making sure the face of my tools is nice and burr free and I can use them comp with confidence knowing that I won't scratch them. That's it. All right. So that's the end of our four series, four, four part series. And all these videos are going to be posted on, the, uh, on our YouTube page. Swix uh, USA, and then also on the Ski Racing Media website. And uh, really appreciate the turnout that we had. It was very cool to see how many people turned out. And I, I hope you got some good information out of it. And uh, feel free to contact us here at Swix if you have any other questions on anything. Um, once again, we're sorry about the, the issue that we had tonight. And um, thanks for joining us. We got a last minute question. We'll take one more. Take one more question. Um, what is one piece of advice you would give to parents of younger racers for tuning? What's one piece of advice I'd give to younger parents for younger racers for tuning? Um, I would say get your, get your kids involved with tuning. Get them tuning as young as you can because it helps them understand their equipment. It's the biggest problem that we have in this country with ski racing right now is the kids don't understand how the skis work. They don't understand how how the, how the bevels work, how the skis turn. And to me, it's about education and getting people, uh, the athletes to engage in equipment setup and tuning. And it just helps them understanding the fundamentals of the sport all the way across the board. We sell wax and tools. It's what we do, we're, we're the best at it. And what I find in the market is it's really underserved. People don't tune their skis enough and they're missing out on a lot of fun and performance. So I would say get them tuning as fast as you can and help them enjoy the sport.